So in the last class, uh, we were discussing about rights and duties. So rights are things that you should be allowed to do. And duties are things which you should do in order to allow people to have rights. So we said that uh, companies, businesses, have to respect uh, the rights of their workers and their customers and all the stakeholders. We said that <coughs> uh, everybody has a kind of dignity, so everybody should be treated with dignity. <coughs> and uh, we split up rights into different uh, sections like legal rights, some kind of voluntary or professional rights and finally some moral rights. So then let's uh, discuss some of the things. We didn't have time to discuss the questions in the last class so uh, we're going to discuss those things now. So we'll discuss with our partner just uh, one question at a time. So let's start with the first question. Uh, what are a manager's fiduciary obligations to the shareholders? So we talked about fiduciary. What does that mean? Fiduciary obligation. What are the fiduciary obligations managers have to shareholders, to the owners? Mm -hmm. Try to make a profit, yes. Anything else? Make him trust. Right. Be trustworthy. Do you understand trustworthy? Are you trustworthy? Trustworthy. So people are trustworthy means that we can trust them. Are you trustworthy? You're not, I can't trust you. <laughs> you are trustworthy. Managers should be trustworthy. Anything else? So this is included in trustworthy, right? They should be transparent. Transparent means let everybody see what they're doing. They should have truthful reporting, be honest, report honestly, and follow what they're asked to do, follow their job description. Okay? Those are the fiduciary obligations. Be trustworthy and try to make a success of the company. And the next question, give an example of how managers only thinking about profits, only thinking about increasing the stock price, how can this infringe on someone's fundamental rights? Do you understand this to infringe somebody's rights? Like break somebody's rights or damage their rights. So discuss with your partner. Our 
we're doing discussion exercise. So can you sit here for this exercise next to him? Okay. And discuss together. You two guys discuss together. Okay, so uh, back you, John. Yes, what do you think? Can you give an example? What did Ford do? Cheaper product if it if we skip the health and safety, if we don't do health and safety, okay? This is a problem with the neoclassical idea. Next question: what is the difference between legal rights and professional rights? So we gave the example of professional rights of some soccer player who can't make some sign, but it's not illegal, but it's not allowed in his profession. So discuss with your partner what is the difference between legal and professional rights. of their client. So if they don't keep the confidentiality or they do some unethical action, they can be thrown out of the law, right? They're not a lawyer anymore, <coughs> apart from the professional association, right? 
Also, the professional soccer player can get that by being a bad example. Okay. So, what about IT professional? IT professional maybe does something like they use the wrong computer program or give some information to the other company. Right? Then they also get some problem. So every profession has its own codes. Do you understand code? Code is list. They make a list of the things you can and cannot do. Okay? What about in the university? What kind of thing that you can do in the university? It's not illegal, but you can get punishment by the university. Cheating. Hmm? Cheating on the exam. Cheating on the exam. Are you going to go to jail? Prison? No? Well, you can get thrown out of the university, okay? So we have a different codes, and these can be voluntary standards, okay? So just the professionals get together, and they make some voluntary standards that everybody should follow, okay? So for example, if we were to go into the university and ask the students, most of the students would say, we don't want cheating on the exam, right? We don't want other students to cheat on the exam. So we want to make this standard. If you cheat on the exam, you get punishment. Okay? So the people get together and they make their own standards for their own profession. It's different than the legal one. And then the last question, what is the difference between fundamental and derivative rights? Can you give an example of a fundamental right and a derivative right, and what's the difference? <clears throat> I'll start with a fundamental right. Can you give an example of a fundamental right? Like what? House. Fundamental right. Right to shelter. Okay. So if we relate this to business, we would call this substance. So the business should pay enough of a salary so that people can pay for shelter and food and so on. Okay? So this is a fundamental right. Okay? So this is like a very fundamental right is a very serious right. Okay? What about derivative right? Can you give an example of a derivative right? So what's the difference between these two right type of rights, this one and this one? What's the main difference between this right and this right? Privacy and substance.
Are they the same? No, because, uh, because first of all, we should keep the fundamental rights and uh, then <coughs> derivative rights, because fundamental is basic. Yeah, so this is a basic one. We have to do this one. <coughs> this one? Second. We don't have to. We, ha we should do, but it, we can infringe, right? <coughs> But we can infringe when, when what? When fundamental rights are at stake, okay? So we can see at the moment there is a lot of debate about privacy in the world because of terrorism, okay? Terrorism is affecting people's right to freedom, right to free speech, okay? So, should we respect the privacy? That's the debate. Okay? How much can the government, in different countries, they're bringing in new laws that the government can check your phone, or the government can check this, or government can check that. Okay? And currently, Apple are fighting with the FBI about whether the Apple should open up the phone of the terrorist or not. Okay? There are a lot of considerations in that case. Because the problem is, it seems very clear that Apple should open up the phone to help the police, right? But then Apple says that if they open up the phone in the US, then maybe another country like Russia or China, any other country, is got, government is going to ask Apple to open up the phone. <coughs> and then if they open up the phone uh, for the terrorists, then next is they have to open up the phone for the murderers, people involved in serious crime. Okay? So it's a debate at the moment. How far should we infringe on people's privacy okay, in order to save this kind of right? But we have that kind of system among rights. One is more important than the other one. So we talked about fundamental rights in the last class. And do you know Hitler? <coughs> We talked about freedom to speech, and when Hitler was coming to power, he had a gang of followers, violence, do you understand violent? And that gang of followers, they used to go to the meeting of the other politician, and they would try to break up the meeting by making the violence, hitting the other supporters of the other politician. So the other politicians couldn't have any public meeting, because Hitler would always send his violent gang and the violent gang would attack all the people. Okay? So they didn't have freedom of speech. So we can see what happens when people don't have freedom of speech. Somebody like Hitler can come to power. We can have a bad situation. Okay? So the fundamental rights are very important that we need to keep, unless we want to have a big problem. Okay? Derivative right we also should keep, but in business we can see businesses also have the problem with privacy. <coughs> How much of our employee, employees' privacy should we know about? What point should we stop at? Okay. So, uh, then let's move on to talk about the negative and positive duties, different types of duties. So, when most people think about uh, duties, they often think about negative duties, but they don't think about positive duties. So, for example, People think about, we shouldn't, we shouldn't hit other people, okay? We shouldn't hit other people. But they don't think about, if those two guys are fighting, I should stop them from fighting, okay? So do you understand the difference here between negative and positive duty? Negative duty, as a teacher, negative means don't do. So don't hit the students, okay? Don't touch the student, don't hit the student. Do you like that? Duty, the teach right, you have the right that the teacher can't touch you. Do you like that? Yeah. Yes, you don't want teacher to hit you. <laughs> what about in the middle school? Did any teacher hit you in middle school? Or elementary school? Hmm? Long time. Yeah? How what did the teacher do? Maybe long time long time ago. Ah. Uh, <laughs> how many years ago? Twenty years. 20 years ago. Sometimes I saw that, I heard that in the Hagwan about 
15 years ago, maybe the teacher grabbed the student by the ear, take out of the class, or make them hold something over their head. Did you ever do that? Yeah. Yes, what did you do? I did that. Holding over uh, your head? Yeah. How do you feel about that? Not so good. Was it respecting your dignity as a person? I didn't, hmm? I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. So they shouldn't do that, right? Nowadays it's illegal to do that kind of thing, right? Are you going to cry? <laughs> Don't cry, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened to you? You said you got, did you have your ear pulled or holding the thing over your head? Which one? Hit on your hand? Yeah. With what? With a stick? Yes. Why? What were you doing? Did <laughs> Didn't do your homework? Okay. Did you like that? Did you think it was good? No? So, the teacher should, nowadays, does that happen these days in Korea? Still happens? Teacher will get into trouble? Yeah, in Ireland it used to happen as well, but maybe longer ago. But I had one teacher in high school, he used to throw this, or the chalk, at the students. Some student was sleeping, or not watching. <laughs> he threw at the student, but he tried to miss the student. He didn't hit the student, just miss the student, and hit the wall behind them. Then they wake up, or suddenly, like that. But well, he was a very old teacher. But the teachers can't do anything like that, right? So that's a negative duty. They can't. Do you understand? They can't do that. But that's the one most people think of, right? You have the right to be treated with dignity, right? You have the right to the non-violence. And then I have the duty not to do that, negative duty. But also I have positive duty, okay? So you guys are fighting. Then I need to stop your fighting. Actually, it happened one time, my first year here. I was walking past the canteen. And two guys start to fight, so I had to stop them from fighting in the university. I don't know why, but they started to fight. <laughs> right? So that is a positive duty. So negative duty in action, for example, not censoring a movie or respecting people's freedom of speech. Positive duty, action to support someone whose rights are being violated. So, for example, security forces have those whose right to free speech is being violated. So these days, if somebody tries to go to the political speech and break up the political speech, then the security forces, the police, will come in and stop the people from doing that. That's positive duty. So in business, we also have negative and positive duties. So a lot of people think in business, just we have to do negative duties. But they don't think a lot about positive duties. So we can see our relationship with all our stakeholders give us both negative and positive, fundamental and derivative rights and duties. So we have a fundamental right to non-discriminatory treatment. So obviously we have the clear negative duty here, which is don't discriminate. Okay? So we have the interview, and you're men, so I just hire you because you're men, and I don't hire you because you're women, right? So I shouldn't do that, don't do that, don't discriminate, negative one. But I also have a positive obligation. Companies should ensure that they have a policy and procedure and system to protect against discrimination, okay? We're going to talk about more about processes in the next chapter, next part, but can you give me any example? What kind of process? or procedure could a company make that stops the discrimination? What kind of rules? Break the discrimination. For example, hire the same rate for men and women. Okay, so make a quota. Like we have to hire 50% men and 50% women, okay? Usually they'll do that lower, at least, right? At least 30 or 40% women, okay? Give some flexibility, okay? Another way is when we're doing the interview, 
we could make sure there's always one woman at the interview. Okay? Always a woman at the interview. So, for example, you three guys are doing the interview, one, two, three, right? And he goes for the interview and she goes for the interview. So you three guys all know him and he plays football together. So you're going to hire him, right? So if we now make at least one woman, you two guys and her are on the interview board. Now it can be a little bit fairer. She tells you two guys, but just because you know him from the football doesn't mean you can hire him, right? And then you agree, you say, yes, that's right. Okay, and then she says, actually, she has more better qualification and experience. And then you guys say, yes, that's right. Okay, and then you decide to hire her. Okay, do you understand what I mean? So just having, always having a woman at the interview, that's one process, okay? Or always having a man, it could be the other way around, we could have three women, right? They decide to hire just one woman. So this is doing something positive, some positive duty. Change our process and change the way we do things. Derivative right to privacy. So again, don't, negative obligation is clear, don't infringe on people's privacy. Don't look at their phone, don't look at their medical records, okay? But we can also do a positive obligation. So the HR department should use some security enhanced information technologies to protect the employee information. So for example, we have all the employee information on the computer, but we should put in proper passwords and encryption to stop other people from looking at the information. Okay? So only the HR department can see, or only the relevant person can see the information that they need to see. Nobody else is going to see it. So we have to make a kind of policy or process like that. So each right has a corresponding duty or obligation. And the obligation is not just a negative obligation. Obligation is also a positive obligation. We have to do something. So here we can see fundamental rights and obligations. Okay? Some of them, like freedom of physical movement, you know, it's kind of exaggerated. So just for business, we just we don't really have a positive. And this is just negative. <coughs> don't I mean we're not I'm not going to chain you to your desk. Okay? You can move around wherever you want. Okay? For example, freedom from torture. Okay? Just we're not going to torture our employees. That's kind of exaggerated. So we don't really need to put something in place to make sure that our employees are not being tortured. Do you understand torture? Torture, fundamental human right, shouldn't be tortured. How do you say torture in Korean? Hmm? How do you say torture in Korean? Go <laughs> moon. Okay. Then non discrimination, we talked about, we need a positive obligation. Physical security. We need a positive obligation. It means that the company might have to put uh, like health and safety, right? If we're doing mining, the company has to make sure we have all the process in place, like wearing the helmet, okay? Wearing the lead, wearing the correct clothes and boots, having some alarm. So we have to do all of that. Freedom of speech and association. So make sure that our employees can say what they like. Minimal education. So we should put in place in our work some educational way that our employees can continue their education as adults. Okay? They can take a language class. They can take management class. They can take another class. So we should have a way that they can improve themselves. Political participation and substance. For substance, we need to make sure that our employees have all of the things they need for living. So, <clears throat> in business, we also have an obligation to protect the environment these days, okay? because the environment is getting damaged. So, uh, we have a positive obligation. Negative obligation, don't pollute the environment. Okay? Positive obligation, 
we should try to make sustainable business practices. So we'll talk about that more later when we talk about CSR and sustainability. Okay? But companies these days have that kind of obligation too. Not just don't pollute the environment, but also do work with NGOs to make plans and processes to make sustainable business plans. So then let's move on to talk about the special obligation. So, do you understand special? Is there anybody in this class who is special? Hmm? Everybody is special, but anybody especially special in this class? That could be, could be classified as special. Especially special. Which students might have a higher degree of vulnerability and dependence? For example, a child is dependent on their parent. Okay? Do you understand dependent? Do you understand vulnerable? How do you say vulnerable in Korean? Vulnerable. Vulnerable means you don't have as much protection or you could be more open to people taking advantage of you or people treating you badly. Like a child has to rely on their parents, they're vulnerable, okay? If the parent wants, they can hit the child, right? The child can't stop them. Client and lawyer. The lawyer knows all about the law and the client doesn't know about the law, okay? So the client has to depend on their lawyer. The lawyer could lie to them, right? That's why some people have a problem with lawyers, because the client comes in and they say, I want to get a divorce from my husband, he's a bad man, okay? And then the lawyer knows that it's very cheap and easy to get the divorce. It just costs a very short amount of time and a small amount of money, right? But the lawyer thinks, ah, this woman doesn't know about the law, so I'm going to tell her, oh, that's going to be very difficult. It's going to take about two years. It's going to cost a lot of money. Okay? And she says, okay then, I'll pay you. How much is it? And the lawyer says, oh, that's $20,000. And then she says, oh, it's very expensive, but I'm going to pay you $20,000. Do you understand? The lawyer says, yes. <laughs> Really, that just costs $1,000. But she doesn't know about the law, so just I can <coughs> charge her whatever I want. Okay? So that is called, in that case, the client is vulnerable and dependent on their lawyer. Dependent on their lawyer. Okay? Just like child and parent. So just I ask generally about this class, is there any special student in this class? More vulnerable and dependent than other students? You don't think so? Hmm? What about the international students? We have three international students. Are they more vulnerable and dependent than Korean students in Korea? Yes. Hmm? Yes. Could people lie to them or take advantage of them more easily because they don't know about Korea and Korean culture? Maybe yes. Maybe yes. Hmm? Okay. So. This is when the needier party can be open for opportunistic exploitation. Okay? So, the benefactors have to take on special obligations to protect the well-being of their subordinate. So, for example, the university has some special obligation to look after the international student, right? So they make some system of body system, right? Supa? Suba? Yes. So they give them some Suba student to help them that kind of thing, right? So that's a special obligation of the university. Or they have some meeting at the start to tell them about life in Korea and those kind of things, okay? The transportation and those things. So the businesses can have special obligation towards some stakeholders who have a special situation and need to be taken care of, okay? So let's look at some special obligations in business. We have the manager and the shareholder. So we gave the example before that I own the shares in Coca-Cola. 
But Coca-Cola has their annual meeting in the US every year. I'm not going to go there. And I don't really know what's happening in Coca-Cola. So who do you think is uh, the person, in this case, uh, who is dependent? And who is the person who is protect protector or benefactor? So who is the benefactor here? Manager or shareholder? Who's the benefactor and who's the dependent? Manager is the benefactor. Yes. Shareholder is the dependent. Yes. Why? Because shareholders rely on managers for reports and information. Okay? I have a stock in Coca-Cola, but I, can't, I don't really know what's happening in Coca-Cola. So I have to rely on the manager, wait for the manager to tell me. Okay, the manager in Coca-Cola tells me this is what's happening in the company. This is the profit we made. These are the decisions we're making. So the manager could try to opportunistically exploit their trust. Are you opportunistic? Opportunistic would be the manager sees an opportunity. It comes from opportunity. How do you see opportunity? Kiwe? Kiwe in Korean? So the manager has an opportunity, they say, oh, I could just use all this money for my, my brother is sick, he has cancer, so I could give all of the money from the company to the, his cancer hospital, like donation, right? Do you understand? So just it's a personal thing, just to, for his own brother's sake, he does that kind of thing. So that's opportunism, that is opportunism. I see an opportunity. Right? I can take the company's money and give to my brother's hospital. Okay? And then the shareholder doesn't know about that or... Right? They may find out later, but may never find out because the manager might hide in the report. Just this money was going to some charity or donation, right? So, managers have a fiduciary responsibility to promote the company's success even if it means they cannot make a comprehensive, environmentally sustainable business plan. So, which is more important for the manager? To make a successful business or to make a sustainable business? If we had to choose only between those two things, successful business or environmentally friendly business, which is more important? What, what do you think the managers would choose? What should a manager choose over success and environmentally friendly? Success. Why? Success is the right answer. Why? If we only have to choose two things. <coughs> yes. So, why? If the company fails, what happens? Hmm? What happens if the company fails? People lose their jobs. What happens if people lose their jobs? No income. Do they pay any taxes? No? Right? So, first of all, we have this fiduciary responsibility for managers to promote the company's success. Okay? If we don't have a successful company, then there's nothing. If we fail, then there's nothing there. Okay? Then after that, we have to do the other points, like sustainable business plan. Okay? So this is a special obligation that managers have to their shareholder to promote the company's success. Okay? So we could get some manager, you're the shareholder in the company, and the manager says, I love the earth, right? A lot. And um, I'm going to spend all the company's money to save the earth. Okay? And then the company fails, and then you lost all your money. Okay? Do you understand? And then the manager broke your trust, because you, you trust the manager to make a successful company. But the manager broke your trust and the company failed. <clears throat> we can also have the vulnerability of desperate employees. Especially, we have the case sometimes of the international employee. Uh, for example, we have the worst case situation in the Middle East, where some companies take the passport. Do you understand the passport? So some people go from Malay Malaysia or somewhere to work in Saudi Arabia, right? And then they take the passport of the worker, the company. And if you leave your job, 
you have to leave Saudi Arabia to the next day. You have to go back to your country. Okay? So the employer controls everything. So we can have a, a kind of a weak employee who's a visa or is dependent on the employer. Then they are in a special obligation situation. Okay? The employer has to take some special care of them. Or we can have some other employees who we need to take some special care of. Right? Uh, also customers. Customers are very trusting. So we could uh, have some group of consumers that we have to make sure that we don't take advantage of, like children, for example. Okay? So the company could try to, they could make some product which is damaging for the children, but we shouldn't do that. We have a special obligation for children that we don't make anything wrong for children. So, do you have any question about this special obligation or positive and negative duties in business? <coughs> so, when we use a special obligation, we can use some, some uh, favoritism or different strategy for the people who are in that special situation. Okay? in order to protect them. <coughs> so, let's then talk about the stakeholder, each stakeholder and their rights and obligations. So, we have fundamental stakeholder rights and the net positive and negative duties we talked about. Stakeholders have fundamental rights even though they don't say anything. Okay? Then we need to identify the special obligations. Right? Relationships with a high degree of vulnerability. So which people are vulnerable? Did anybody search for vulnerable in the dictionary? Yes. Uh, what is the Korean word for vulnerable? Weak by things. Can be damaged because of their weak situation. That kind of thing. Okay. So second, we should identify and prioritize derivative stakeholder claims and corresponding negative and positive rights and duties. So first we identify fundamental rights and our negative and positive duties. Then we identify the derivative stakeholder claims and their negative and positive duties. For example, derivative rights can be overridden, but that should be justified, we talked about before, with privacy rights. So let's have a look at some examples. So competitors. Competitors have the right to fair competition. So it means you don't make a monopoly. Do you understand monopoly? Okay. And you don't break the law or fraud. So what duties do we have? Always keep the laws relating to antitrust, anti-corruption. Don't offer bribes. Okay. So you're in competition with him to get some business contract, and you offer me a bribe. That is not fair competition. How do you say bribe? Korean. Bribe. Mm -hmm. ne Nemo. Yes. Nemo. Okay, so we don't give any bribe. So that's negative obligation. What's positive obligation? <coughs> Make a formal ethics and legal compliance system. So unfortunately, bribery is a problem in the world. Some countries is worse than others. Okay. Uh, we have, we'll talk about it more later, what we can look at now. Do you, have you ever heard of Transparency International? What does transparency mean? Transparency International has a Corruption Perceptions Index. Do you understand Corruption Perceptions? Perception means what people think about or feel about. My perception is how I see something. Index is like list or group. And you understand corruption? How do you say corruption in Korean? Groupe. So what do people think about corruption? So what they do is they go to a country and they ask the top business people, how do you feel? How much corruption is in your country? Are people paying bribes to politicians? Okay. So it's really just subjective. 
it's just asking people and getting the answers to the questionnaire in each country. And people who do business in other countries, right? More than 6 billion people live in countries with a serious corruption problem. So actually, corruption is the main reason why we have the bottom billion in the world. Bottom billion is the bottom uh, people who is not getting out of poverty. It's because of corruption. Okay? Poor governance. The main solution is education. Educate the main population. If the main population is educated, then they can understand that the government is corrupt. Okay? The problem is in many countries, people don't have the education, so they don't understand the government is corrupt, and they don't understand what's happening. Right? That they're in a very unequal situation. So if we can make more people educated, we can help. But we can see here, this is a kind of a world map. Do you think the dark color is higher corruption or lower corruption? Hmm? Higher corruption? Who said lower? <laughs> so highly corrupt here, zero to nine. Very clean. Typically, Nordic countries are the cleanest. This is the cleanest one, Finland, right? Denmark and Finland. Here we have Northern Europe and the US. Uh, we can see Canada is less corrupt than the US. So maybe culturally, this is also due to culture. Uh, do you know the religion, Protestant religion and Catholic religion? Both of them are Christian. Do you know why the Protestant religion started? In Germany, Martin Luther. Did you ever study about that in history? Hmm? Catholic religion, uh, some people say that kind of religion is uh, as corrupt. Yeah. Yes, so because of the corruption in the Catholic Church, for example, the priests were living in a really big house with a gold furniture, right? Some people got very angry, like Martin Luther, and they decided to start their own church, Protestant church, with no corruption. Okay? So we can see that the Protestant countries are generally less corrupted than the Catholic countries. Okay? Can you understand that historical reason? The reason that